Um, a very good afternoon to everyone and thank you, Swati. Um, I think before I go into what I came here to talk about, I have to say that uh, pretty much participating in this event has given me a new perspective to what I set out to do. Uh, just by way of a brief introduction, I kind of echo current sentiment. I'm a corporate lawyer, uh, more than two decades of experience. Uh, I'm a partner at Shardul Namarchand Mangaldas, one of the premier law firms in this country. And my entire career in law has been helping, like Karan said, economic liberalization and helping the country pretty much develop into the liberal economy, which has kind of percolated to a different kind of change. Uh, so I believe that as a corporate lawyer, we have contributed to the development of the country. It's not a direct impact on lives, but it's an indirect impact. Uh, but still realizing somewhere as a lawyer that there is more to it than an indirect impact. Um, I think I heard a lot of people say a lot of things that echo with what I have been dealing with, uh, grappling with, or trying to understand. But I think resonate most with what Karan said coming from the corporate law background where we are successful corporate lawyers. We have contributed to setting up large MNCs. We've done foreign direct investments. We've done overseas direct investments. We've um, pioneered, uh, like for me, for example, um, liberalization of the insurance sector, bringing private insurance companies, forming strategic alliances, a new era in the insurance sector, which has helped millions and millions of people access insurance, which is important. And we've seen the importance during the COVID times. Similarly, I think we've contributed in the defense sector where we open up the defense sector on the private side. So there have been contributions, yet we feel that somewhere we haven't really made the change to impact the large population that we talked about. I think we heard in the beginning, uh, from such in 1.3 billion. So while we have economically developed, while we have seen growth, while we, while we are on the international map, there is a huge gap. Uh, there are the haves and the have nots. And the economic disparity, not just economic, but education and access to a lot of things for the widens this gap today as we are developing further. So with that, I'm going to just kind of uh, answer and propose um, an initiative I started, and this is what I thought I could do uh, to take from what Karan said, and I think uh, what Arya has mentioned. Um, I set out during COVID times to set Satya, the pro bono law firm. Um, again, I'm not a dispute litigating lawyer. I am not adept at that, but the vision here was to set up a pan-India pro bono law firm to provide quality legal services, the same amount of respect, dignity, institutionalized framework that we are used to seeing when we provide services in a corporate setup. Um, I have had the opportunity of visiting courts, have seen cases, have seen how trial courts work, how people are generally suffering. And I think the important part here, very, very valid points made, that it's not always, access to justice is not always about going to court. I think the large, vast majority of the country does not really need access to courts. It's probably pre-litigation. And for that, again, the infrastructure is clearly lacking. I'm going to be a little candid here. Uh, the infrastructure, not just in the judicial system, when we go down to uh, courts, trial courts, or we go down to enforcement agencies and thanas, we look at sensitization in dealing with human rights violations, issues, and rights. I think our infrastructure is clearly lacking. And I say this from the experience of having gone to courts in Delhi, to thanas in Delhi. This is the national capital. And I've heard stories where a normal police official sitting in a thana, I would say probably his human rights are being violated, telling me, Madam, please bring your own pen and paper in Hindi, of course. I said, why doesn't the government provide you with pen and paper? He said, Madam, I have to buy our own stationery. I was shocked. They were literally working in 
what I would say is pretty much very harsh conditions and expected to do a job where they were supposed to be sensitive to people and deal with issues where probably if they themselves are unhappy, cannot really provide that kind of service. They are overburdened, they are overworked, they don't have the means and the infrastructure and the pay is nothing really to talk about. They barely survive and then we talk about corruption. Um, I happen to be um, also a white collar crime investigator where I'm investigating huge fraud scams in corporates percolating down to issues of bribery, money laundering, et cetera. And when you look at the whole ecosystem and the disparity, you kind of understand where the genesis of all of this is. And I think one message that I wanted to say here is um, at the cost of being extremely candid and maybe a little harsh, we need to look at the ground reality. We need to accept the ugly truth, honestly, before we can make or come up with suggestions, great suggestions, great ideas, based more so on everyone's individual experience, but not really on empirical data and studies. I think I heard Abhay mention from Zenith, and I heard Renuji talk about women rights issues, different geographies, different cultures, different stratas, different issues, different empirical data, and therefore different solutions. I think Sachin um, uh, mentioned in the beginning of diversity. The access to justice solution, honestly, has to take into account the wide array of issues we are dealing with. And for that, at least to my mind, while experience is great, um, it helps us share our experiences and bring it to a common platform. I think for me, this has been an eye opener. But I think empirical data and research is a prerequisite to structure any solution to put resources, money, time, and effort that is going to lead to any concrete result. Um, I think a lot of times we take up initiators because we all have good intentions. We invest time, money, effort, but the desired result is not pretty much there. Um, so I'm going to leave with that and just end with what Satya does and a call out to Karan. I think the idea of Satya law was to set up a pan-India law firm for pro bono law, incentivizing their retainer lawyers who are paid retainer salaries just like any law firm lawyer is paid so that they can be dedicated, to invite all law firms to partner and be a member firm of this platform. We've collaborated and National Law University has, Delhi has been very kind to our space. And the idea is to use all universities across India and the law firm network and the network of lawyers to collaborate and have a core team of retained lawyers who are financially taken care of to be able to come up with core specializations. I think there was a point made here that you need different specializations to be effective, whether it's child rights, women's rights. So to set up this pan-India law firm that provides quality legal services in a timely manner with specialization and with the help of all law firms who can participate and contribute in different ways to bring about that change, it's just an idea. I don't know where it's going to go in the near future, but I think it's probably the first of its kind. And I've heard uh, students come up to me and say, it seems a bit like Harvey Specter from Suits. Uh, but yes, having achieved uh, international fame, acclaim, reached a certain pinnacle, financial independence, I think corporate law firms do have a lot to contribute and we all can kind of pioneer this initiative and make that difference. Uh, with that, um, I'm sorry, I had made a presentation, but I'm not sharing that uh, because I just thought everybody had made all the valid points. And uh, for me, this has just been a very enriching experience. So thank you very much.